I'm going to talk about the script for Saving Mr. Banks, which was written by Kelly Marcel, and it was written by Kelly Marcel and Sue Smith. Now, the one of the strengths of this screenplay is how it was able to use the now in the first ten pages it was able to use the a combination of imagery, dialogue, and subtext to establish characters, conflict, and the structure of the movie. Now the movie starts with little Pamela Travers or Ginty. She's described as, she wraps her arms tightly around, she's in the park as a child, and it says, she wraps her arms tightly around her chest, lifts her face to the sky, a half smile is meant to break across her concentrated face. The little brow is furrowed with imagination. All of a sudden, the smile breaks free, something in her mind becomes real. Now, the ad, in the very next scene, in, which is set in 1961, Mrs. Travers, as an adult, is described as being in the exact same position. Not only does this establish the structure of flashing back to Mrs. Travers' childhood, but the imagery, is, I believe, is used to show off one of Mrs. Travers' major flaws, that she clings to the memories of her childhood. Now, the first bit of dialogue in here, the conversation between Mrs. Travers and her agent, D.R. Mood Russell, has a lot going for it, too. Like, they talk over each other, and there's a lot of interrupting. Like, and it's obvious that she's in her own little world, instead of paying attention to Mr. Russell. Like when he asks her if she's ready, she makes a remark about how like the cherry blossoms are like pink clouds on sticks. Diarmuid, excuse me? The cherry blossoms. I was trying to think of what they... Now, they're... Okay. Then, okay, okay. <clears throat> so, Russell, Mr. Russell, she also states to this, the flaw, another flaw is also established, she's really stubborn. He's, when Russell, her agent, mentions that the car should be coming soon. She says that she's canceled it. And he gets upset. And he says, and Mrs. Travers says, I know what he's going to do with her. She'll be cavorting and twinkling, careening towards a happy ending like a kamikaze. Yeah, so, yeah, she's really stubborn. She doesn't want Disney to have her beloved character, Mary Poppins. It's interesting to note here that Mrs. Travers and Russell never actually mention Dis outright mention Disney and Mary Poppins in this conversation. They just, yeah, like they there is some exposition in here. Like, like Russell mentions that Mrs. Travers is almost out of money and really needs to make this deal with Disney. And that she and Disney have already been at it for 20 years. But the audience already knows that this is about Mary Poppins. And she and Russell have obviously had this conversation before. So there is no need to... There is no need to state what they and, by extension, the audience already know. They just stick the exposition to what the audience does not know. We also get a sense of Mrs. Travers' more vulnerable side with a little bit of subtext. She's 
she says you don't know what she means to me in a very soft voice as described in the script. Now, uh, as part of this difficulty communicating between Travers and her agent, he thinks that she's talking about her recently fired maid, Polly, and she very snappishly says, of course not, Polly. Okay. Well, it's obvious that there is more to Trevor's refusal to let Disney have Mary Poppins, not just her distaste for what she perceives as Walt Disney's sugary sweetness. She definitely doesn't want to talk about it with Russell. So, yeah, nice little bit of subtext. You know, another, it's also a good catalyst for the rest of the movie, a good inciting incident. Like, by this, this stuff has already been going on for quite a while, but what finally sets Mrs. Travers off to L.A. is because she really needs to get some more money. She also gets rather snappish with her agent when he keeps talking about how she's running out of money. Stop saying money. It's a filthy, disgusting word. There's obviously more to that, too, than just being annoyed with him. He's obviously hit a sore spot. There come... Then, okay, the scene cuts to the, f the year 1906, like it was in the beginning, with little Ginty, Mrs. Travers, younger self. <laughs> and it establishes her relationship with her father. Now, in the, at this point in the screenplay, her father does get his name, Travers Goth. But the audience won't know it for that his name for quite a while, so, and that be, when it becomes really important, when he is the, the playfulest relationship between Ginty and her father is established, like, like, he says he's missing one of his daughters, he has a special name for her, he can't quite remember what it is, so, Ginty finally says, Ginty? And her dad says, why, thank you, ma'am. Ginty, it is, of course. B, have you seen her? Ginty, it's me. And whatever her dad says, gosh, so it is. Well, thank goodness for that. I was positive I was going to be beheaded for losing her highness, the royal princess, Ginty McFlever Fluffy. Ginty says, you can't lose me. And her father says, of course not. I would never lose you. This becomes a little sadder later because he's not the one who's lost. Well, she, he's not the one who, she's not the one who gets lost. There's a little subtle thing in here, too. More dialogue. Their, Ginty's family's preparing to leave their old home and move. And she tells her nanny, Goodbye, goodbye, Katie, Nana, see you soon. And, well, if you're familiar with Mary Poppins, you probably remember that Katie Nana was the original Banks nanny who quits at the beginning of the movie. The fact that Ginty's childhood nanny has the same name as this fictional character might lead the audience to wonder, are any other characters in the movie, in Mary Poppins named after or based on people from the author's life? And, of course, it it is that is revealed in more detail later. So, yeah, the first ten pages does a good job at setting up all of this thing, all these things that become much more important upon further watching or reading, or reading the screenplay. Like, it doesn't may not make sense right away, but when you watch the rest of the movie, everything, the, the stuff from the first ten pages suddenly gets a whole new meaning. And there's other little bits in here, too, that have more meaning later in the movie, but they're not in the first ten pages, so I shouldn't mention them. Thank you.